sure. Oh, that would work. Okay. Um, so what would a hypertextual video look like? So by that term hypertext, um, there are some sort of readings that you've been asked to play around with, and you can kind of quickly look at it in Wikipedia if you haven't had a chance. But what would a, what would a hypertextual video, what does that imply to you? What would that look like? Embedded video into an HTML page. You can embed video into an HTML page. That's but what kind of video? So let's chunk hypertext the way that we're using it in TiddlyWiki means to chunk out information into smaller and smaller segments. So I want to, if you look, you're looking at the uh, screen now. I want to do a. Um, a presentation where I'm going to walk through each of those studio projects that are listed on those tabs there and each of the initiatives. And I want to spend about four or five minutes talking about each because these are things that you can build on for your projects. Okay. So the other day when I was working with Billy, he's like, okay, I'm done my third week. What do I do now? And same with David, I gave them pop-up tagger and you'll see that that will show up in one of these initiatives. But I'm going to record this whole conversation. And I want to make it easy for my readers, my viewers, the people using it who are going to watch this video, to get closer to the information that they need. So what would that look like and what would that feel like? What would a, how could I weakify the video I'm in the process of recording right now? You could apply, again, <clears throat> are you putting it directly into the wiki or are you... Um Hosting it on, say, YouTube and then embedding it in. Well, let's say I'm going to host the YouTube on. I'm going to host the video on YouTube and embed the video. Okay. I want you could take the tabs that you have per each lecture, so you'd have a Monday lecture and a Wednesday lecture. You could you could date them by month and then drop down tags, right. drop down tabs that lay out each day in the month, and then the lecture video could pop down underneath that. So. If I understood what you said correctly, you're suggesting I create separate videos for each tab? That's correct. That was what I was saying, yes. I don't want to create separate videos. That requires me to upload and manage all these videos. I'm only going to have one video. Hmm. Okay. So what we're going to do, and you all are going to help me because you have no choice because you're here. That deserves a smile at least. Um, is we're going to set start and stop points in our video and we're going to make links to that YouTube video that say start here and end here. Mm. We're going to weakify the video by chopping it up into smaller chunks but not actually touching the file. We're going to sort of like a link directly into a specific start point and stop point. Anybody know how to do that? On video and YouTube? Yeah, it's like doable. I don't know exactly how to do it, but we're going to figure it out. Yeah, but you can't put, as far as I know, I can't put a marker in a video that YouTube serves that says go to next, go to next. I have to make a link to it, start here, stop here. Okay, well. There's, uh, well, I was sort of watching the video yeah. last night. <laughs> He embedded in his video. I'm too lazy to do that. I'm recording this video on Zoom. As we speak, it's recording on my computer. When I'm done, I'm going to upload it to YouTube. I'm not touching it afterwards. I'm not even going to watch it. I'm not going to edit it. No post-production allowed. Because we're trying to make things easy for people as producers. So we're going to weakify the video that we're about to make collaboratively. And um, when you leave, Looking at that, you know, that's up on my screen and might be up on yours. When you click on each of those tabs, there's going to be a link to the specific part of the YouTube video that talks about that. And if you can make it happen. So, David, if you're not, let's do a push to talk. So, kind of mute yourself so we don't get your background noise. I'm sorry. That's all right.
So yeah, um, can everybody hear him? Okay. So, um, and David, if you can hear me, that means my audio channel is open. So I'm very happy that you're listening because last time I tried to do this in the class, I forgot to unmute myself and I went to listen to my excellent video and there was no sound, so it was useless. That's a, that's a good test for me to be all the way over here. At least you know I'm hearing you. <laughs> okay, so the reason I'm gonna show you all these projects and initiatives, the next exercises and, and your projects for the rest of the semester allow you to work on any of those initiatives, any of my projects, or create your own. So I'm gonna get you started with saying, oh, here, you can pick this one, you can pick this strand, you can pick this, and then it really allows you to pursue your own interests. And I'll continue to provide exercises to like develop this skill and develop this skill. But you'll notice my exercises to date have been content free. And it's time to get some content. You've got the basic skills. Um, everything else is enrichment. If you can link, you can tag as a writer. You can, you can engage in the process of writing links, writing tags, writing transclusions, writing filters, and soon you'll be writing templates. So now it's time to actually start designing. You know, all the other skills you need are just enrichment and more of what you already have. So you've got the fundamental skills, and now we'll start adding in some intriguing layers. Um, so the next exercises will be less prescriptive, more descriptive, and saying, oh, go explore something. And they're not particular, they're just like, you gotta start producing a body of work that you share in the studio that we critique. Okay, so just like if this were a painting class or a sculpture class, you'd come in, sit down, and get to work and work on your painting. And I'm not gonna say, well, you gotta make a painting you use four different colors and six different shapes, and it's gotta be this size, and when you're done, submit it and we'll look at it. I mean, we could do that, but that's not how art and design is created. It's created by people working in a studio and you leaning over to the person next to you saying, hey, do you have a brush I can borrow because I can't get my lines thick enough? Or how'd you get that texture? Except, of course, it's coat. So you're ready? You got questions? John, you ready to go? I have no idea what's going on. I'm not sure. Okay. Well, I have ideas. <laughs> good. So what do you mean you have no idea what's going on? I'm going to show you all sorts of things I've done. No, but I'm going to show you what's going on. Is I'm going to show you all the little crevices of my mind that have been occupied by TiddlyWiki for the past six months, and especially the past three months, where I'm just playing with all sorts of stuff, and I walk around with this TiddlyWiki in the brain, and I want you to, too, as well. I want all of you to do that as well, a little bit, so whenever you see something in the world, you say, huh, I could weakify that, and then come in and do it, because that's how you learn to design and write interactive texts. You see them, you use them. Now you say, I can build that. And it's not like some of the things you're gonna build have never been built before. And some of the things you're gonna build, others have built, but now you've reverse engineered it and built it into the week. Like Google News is weakified. Facebook is a week. Twitter is a wiki because they've got these objects floating around and they display them when you ask them to be displayed. Like you say, oh, show me all the tweets for the past five minutes. That's a filter. Show me the person who tweeted it and their tweet and their picture. That's not any different than what you did when you said, show me the red squares and the actual squares as well as the title of the tidbit. So the, you live in the world of interactive text, you use it, you read it all the time, you write, you make websites or games, things that are interactive texts, but you don't, you don't use the hammer and the nail to build it, or the screwdriver or the drill. And that's what we're doing, is we're starting with TiddlyWiki, which is a blank slate, and now make something in that, use this tool, and you can make anything, I don't know that you can make anything that would be production worthy. You know, that you could actually say, hey, Twitter's gonna pay, you know, or Google's gonna pay me $2 billion for this product that I built in Tiddly Week. Because I'm not sure it scales, but maybe it does, but we're not interested in that level. We're interested in, can you make a concept piece 
and then maybe you turn it over to a programmer who could actually make it so that you could have 10 million of them, right? So I can make something, you'll see something here. I brought in, I've got, I'm up to 7,000 objects in a week, and it's a little slow, it begins to slow down. Um, James, one of the other students who took the class last year and, and still works with me on his thesis, he's an IDT student, he brought in 70,000 tweets into his wiki the other day. So he can navigate through 70,000 tweets. How long did it take you, James? I said, well, 20 minutes for it to import. Okay. You know, we can maybe live with that. I'm, again, it's like, obviously that's not an acceptable product in the commercial world. If it takes, you know, the thing's too slow, but at least it gives him the opportunity to play with that kind of data. Okay, so even if John doesn't know what we're doing, and even if Bill's back there saying, okay, let's go, we're gonna go. And you'll get it in an hour. Yeah. I'm very confident. I am. So if I've got an audience, a live audience of five, and a recorded audience of millions of people who are taking this TiddlyWiki course around the world, not, but we're gonna go. Um, one thing that I could use help with here, and, um, David, this feels like a task for you. Um, as I move forward and say, okay, next, okay, here's the next project. If you could um, just keep track of the time, okay. and then when we're on this, send me the timestamp when I said, okay, we're going to the next one, because I need those timestamps to put into the video, okay? So, so um, be a chat or just unmute my mic and say, this is the time? Oh, just put it in a tiddler somewhere, and when we're done, send me the wiki. Oh, okay. Put it on a piece of paper and take a picture of it and send it to me later. Or no, but I'll work with you to figure out how to do that later. But yeah, I just need the timestamps because that's what we're going to need. And I get all excited about my stuff and can't keep track of it. Perfect. So that's your job. Okay. Let me grab a pencil and paper and we'll be ready to roll. Yep. Okay. So we're going to start. It's 1016. That's our stop, our start time. And I'm going to start with the first project that I'm using, which I call 9 11 and 20. Okay. And, um, and that's on that screen. It's, and if you'd rather see it on one of the Macs, I think that's actually a good, I like what Shane does. He looks on the big screen, but you can also look on your own screen however you want, but just sort of follow along with me. So, okay, first project that, that you have an opportunity to work on. And so the difference between a project and an initiative, a project is actually something I'm doing. Okay, so I have a life outside this class, not much of one, I'll admit. But I'm doing a bunch of research projects, and this one has actually been accepted at a conference. Okay, so the, the, the project involved me writing a proposal, and it's been accepted to a conference. It's going to be presented at this conference in London in June. Um, so now I actually have to do the work. Okay, and it involves Tiddly Wiki. So I'm going to click on current, which should open a new tab, um, and we'll, hello, Sid, how you doing? which will take you to my current version of this project, okay? And I'm gonna spend five minutes till about 10.21 talking about it, and then I'll move to the next one. Um, so none of these are updated, of course, because you know I just got accepted from the conference, so I haven't updated this. But this is what happens in this project if you're interested in it. Um, several years ago, I had a student who studied, um, I'm sorry, let me back up many years ago. 9-11 was 2001. Okay, remember that vaguely, right? It was a major event, seismic. Um, the day after, so on 9-12, um, I was chatting with a collaborator of mine. I was engaged in some projects, and then we talked to, the, and we were working with the Library of Congress, and we were working with the Internet Archive. We said, you know what we need to do? We need to archive the web so that we can capture what happened on the web in response to the terrorist attacks. And it was cool. We collected a bunch of URLs. We collected 30,000 websites every single day from the 12th of September to the 1st of December. That's a lot. So that's a huge pile of bits. Um, the next year we did some projects. I looked at 250 of them in detail. And then we looked at 2,500 of them in slightly less detail. And built a database about who made them and stuff like that. Now I'm getting ready for the 20th anniversary of 9-11, which is in three years, we just or four years from now, but I'm gonna seek some funding for it. And what we're gonna do, or what I'm doing in this project, is figuring out a way to use TiddlyWiki 
to serve as a front end to the archive, to have deep links to the archive pages and stuff like that. Um, so if you see here, there's like a photograph there from 9-11-01, and I think, um, and there's links to the raw pages there, and somewhere we're going to connect these two. My goal is to create a system where ordinary people could come to my website, 9-11 at 20, whatever it's going to be called, and navigate through the archive and say, oh, show me some pictures of the search dogs. And they can tell a story by linking or shut up. Every day at 20 like the new room yet. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so they could do that and they there'd be a whole system to allow people to build stories out of these archived objects. So what you could do is work with me and we'll pick a little strand that says, well, can you just go find 10 objects and make links to them and tell a story? So you just build a sample. So that would be pretty cool for the 9-11 at 20 project. Um, those of you who are contemplating master's thesis, none of you in this room, but those of you who are doing um, you know, independent studies or projects for other classes might find this useful. Um, and this might end up being a funded project that you could work on. Um, so the 9-11 at 20 project is kind of cool. And um, it's a little open-ended, like all of these are, but I need different pieces of the project built into the week. So that's the first one. Um, I'm not going to Lisbon, I'm going to London. Um, okay, so that's 1021, David, so now we're gonna move on to the next one. Okay, and my intention here, uh, questions you can say, hey, can I do this, can I do that? Let me know. Oh, let me back up on 9-11 at 20. Sorry, I forgot one thing. Um, I had another student um, a couple years ago who did a really cool project, but he looked at the blog posts that we found that were posted on the 12th and 13th of September. Um, at that time, blogging was brand new. So the bloggers in 2001 were, I mean, these were innovators. But they posted some really, like, really interesting um, um, let me see, do I have his in here? I don't. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have it. Oh, well. But he posted some really, he, he did an analysis of really interesting blog posts, people who wrote the next day from the city and said, I can see the smoke, you know. And then he made these beautiful images, these wordles, tag clouds, based on the words. And we're going to do a similar kind of analysis. So the the weekly work is go get the old stuff, get the blog posts, bring the blog posts in and let's start marking up those texts to see if we can see common themes, common words, and it's like a piece of analysis. So, okay, so that's the 9-11 to 20 project. Um, 1022, David, we'll move on to the CIT 2017 conference panel. Um, for those who are interested in education, in teaching, um, I'm working on a panel here with five other professors from SUNY Poly, maybe four other professors. Um, and we are doing, um, building a set of educational resources to support their classes. So in a sense, this is an educational resource, my wiki is. And each of these four professors are doing something different in their classes. Um, one of them is going to try and develop his slides in TiddlyWiki so it will tie back to his lecture notes. Someone else is building a syllabus in TiddlyWiki so that um, it'll sort of tie together. Um, people are using it as blog. They're doing all sorts of things as open educational resources. An open resource is something that's open source and free. Um, SUNY is at the forefront of a, well, at least at the beginnings of a national movement to make college um, less expensive. And one of the ways we're doing that is we're going to say, you know, why do you guys go out and spend 200 bucks for a textbook? Why do our libraries spend thousands of dollars to subscribe to journals that our faculty have written that we've paid them to write and then we have to pay them to, we have to pay to read it. So we're building these things that are called open, open educational resources or free. Um, and any, if you're interested in creating classroom resources using TiddlyWiki, um, there you go. That's a project and you can slice a piece of it off to do an exercise with. Um, uh, I don't know if you know what the EPUB 
format is. EPUB is an open ebook file format. Um, we can take any EPUB book and ingest it into TiddlyWiki in a native form. So we can take each chapter becomes a tiddler, each section becomes a tiddler. You can navigate that. And then you, if you want to explore how to become a sense of publisher using TiddlyWiki, you can do that. Um, you can take, I can't, but you can. You can take any Kindle book and save it as an EPUB by converting it from a Kindle format to an EPUB format. That means you can take any text that you can get in EPUB or Kindle and simply weakify it for educational purposes or for other purposes. So you don't have to create your own text. You can take somebody else's text and weakify it. I'd encourage you to use the um, textbooks. Um, SUNY is, as a system, not the campus, the system is very big in now promoting free and open source textbooks written by its professors for its students, and we could participate in that. We can take any, and it's, that's cool. Okay, that's an open educational resource, um, and you could contribute to an existing project by working with one of those five or four professors or doing something on your own, and then we're going to present this at a conference in June. Um, in um, we get to go to Oneonta. That's big travel. London conference, more exciting. Oneonta, not such a good location, but close to my house. Um, and so you could sort of work at that level of research. So those are the two projects that I've got working on that have, so as a project, it's like something, the studio that I'm doing, it's my role as professor and inviting all the participants in the studio, the students in 375 and 575 to participate in these actual research projects um, and produce something with us. And so if you're interested in following through on open educational resources or archive experimentation or exploitation or analysis, you say, hey, I wanna work on that project, then we'll work on that project. Um, and by the way, what it does is it gets you for those, for if it would be of any interest or value to you, you get to write in your resume, hey, I was a research assistant in the Design Rights Studio, and I participated in this project. So it's, you get to do it both for class, and it's sort of like an external non-class activity. Um, and those of you who are IDT students and writing master's theses or projects, there you go. And those of you who want to pursue an independent study project, this could last beyond the class. These are projects that are ongoing and multi-year projects. Okay, John, are you catching on? You know what we're doing here? Okay, ready to move on? Okay, so 1027, we're gonna start looking at my initiatives. Um, an initiative is just like a kernel of an idea that is cool and lets us do something and you can follow any one of these or create your own initiatives. Okay, so those of you who say, I don't know what to do, you pick one of those 10 tabs and say, I'll work on that for an exercise and I'll see if it's interesting. Those of you who say, oh, I know exactly what I want to do, create your own initiatives and we'll add them to this list. Okay. Um, if anybody's into math, um, TiddlyWiki um, does cool math. This stuff there, the uh, math formatting um, is written like this. Okay, so you can write, is anybody here into math? In the math, you'll find this attractive. If you don't care about math, I'm just going to move on. Um, math teachers, my IDT class, I might have some math teachers who want to teach. And, and the, the issue with math is that it's really hard to write formulas and to repeat them. So you have to do it in a very particular way. And it really sucks in word. And it's really intriguing in TiddlyWiki that you can intermix non-math and math together. So if you're into math, we'll do it. Um, there's a math professor who wants to convert all of her lecture notes into TiddlyWiki, and then that becomes a job or a project for a student. You say, okay, I'll do that. I get it. I'll figure out how to make it work for you, and I'll create a whole system for you to write math. And then maybe your math students will do it too. So that's one of the, that's what, actually a CIT project for the conference in June, but also is a separate thing if you're interested in doing math. 
Um, I'm going to move on quickly and not spend much time because I don't know that there's a lot of interest in math here. Okay, uh, 1029, David. Um, the idea of navigable essays. Um, any of you who have ever written an essay for college, um, high school, you've written them in Word pretty much, right? Paragraph one, paragraph two, how many of you did the standard five paragraph essays? Lots of you, all of you. How many of you maybe still have a class in like humanities or social sciences where you have to write the five page paper, makes an argument, you're done with those, Billy? No, I don't have to do that. But any of you who might have to do it, or if you've done it in the past, you can say, hey, I'm going to take my English 101 papers and I'm going to weakify them. So you've got the content that you've created and now let's weakify it. Let's reimagine it as a navigable essay. So if you look at this example here, um, I'm into assisted suicide. You know, I teach this course called The Politics of Life and Death. We study abortion, assisted suicide, cloning, and something else. Assisted reproduction. And this is like an essay. The first paragraph, the topic sentence is, oh, assisted suicide is a legal quagma. It's a moral dilemma. It's part of our everyday lives. There's lots of reasons to oppose it. And then you have these arguments below it that allow people to navigate through your essay instead of read it linearly. So the logic involved in writing a navigable essay as opposed to writing a linear essay is what I'm trying to capture as a skill. Um, so if you were to do, to say, okay, I want to build that, you'd begin to look, understand a little bit of that code. That looks pretty nasty. Um, but it's all sort of fill in the blank in algebra. Um, and this is early stage, but the idea would be to take this idea further and create a template that others could then, who didn't know a whole lot about Tiddly Wiki, could then sort of do in a plug and play. So you learn the code, you figure out how it works, you pick the colors, um, and then it creates a project. Um, I'm really um, annoyed about that, but I'm really excited about this. Okay, this is cool. You can do this for a five paragraph essay, you can do this for a 50 page uh, paper, you can do this for a 500 page book. So it's not object-based, right? There's no shapes, there's no cars, there's just text and logic and understanding how to outline it. Questions? Not yet, okay. 1032, David. Paul Blay, oh, there's nothing on Blay. Oh no, where's my Paul Blay link? I'm gonna find it manually. Um, sorry for the, um, where did I put Paul Blay? I was moving stuff around last night and I might have missed it. Um, anybody see Paul Blay discography? Here it is. Paul Blay Weakified. There's the folder. Demo. Demo one, always take the latest one. And that was a mistake. I needed demo two as well. Okay, Paul Blay um, is a famous jazz pianist who happened to live in Cherry Valley, my hometown. And he died recently. And he made like 80 albums in his lifetime. Okay, I'm not a big fan of jazz. You can replace Paul Blay with any musician. And what I've done is created what's called a discography. And I don't know, I have like 50 songs in it so far. So you can surf by album or by songs or by year. Okay, so I'll pick 1961. He didn't make any albums. Um, so right there is a problem with my wiki. 1957, he didn't make any albums, so we'll stop doing that. Um, but what's kind of cool about this is you can search by song. And so here's the song Albert's Love Theme. And those are all the albums that it appeared on. So essentially what I'm suggesting here is with some, some this is an object-based wiki, right? You collect a bunch of songs. Um, it could be a bunch of videos. It could be anything. 
that are tagged in a different, um, let's look at some of the innards here. Um, this all uses fields. And so it allows you to, um, in fact, let me show you how this is done. There's the, there's the tiddler called the, for the song. And then here's the template. So anytime it, it finds a tiddler that's a song, you use a template that gives you a set of instructions for how to display it. Okay, so this is sort of standard web de design, but uses this other feature called templating. We've done, we've already done linking, tagging, filtering, and transcluding, and this is the fifth technique called templating. So it says, okay, is the current tiddler a song? Yep. H1, that's a heading one, put the word song, and then run a filter finding all the tiddlers that, are, that have this song and tell me what album they're on. And so when we look at, the, at a song, um, Albert's love theme, here's all the, this is the product of that template. Um, this is pretty minimalist right now. Um, this tells you about the album. The only thing I'm missing here is a bunch of, I had a bunch of MP3 files and I had some artwork for each album. This would be pretty cool. You could create a playlist machine. You're saying, well, doesn't Spotify do that? I say, yeah, but you could do this, right? You could build the own, your own Spotify, if you will, your own playlist machine out of music and do whatever it is that you want to do. So the option of creating something out of a lot of objects is there. And that's really the, um, the idea here of the Paul Blay archive, and what I'm gonna do is copy this, go back to here, um, find the Paul Blay wiki, or Tiddler, and create a link to it, and put it in double brackets, example, vertical bar, paste the link, close the brackets, edit the link to make it updog.co, it's really dangerous to do this, but I'm doing it anyway. Um, oh yeah, this is the reason that this is, um, yeah, this is still being stored on GitHub, so I'll have to move it eventually. And let's see if it works. It does. Okay, so now I've built a link to it. So that's the Paul Blay archive, but the concept is again of building a collection of objects that you can navigate on multiple dimensions. So my objects there were songs and albums and years, just like you did in my wiki three, my third wiki, you brought in shapes and you, right? So, um, so you can do this. Um, this approach uses a spreadsheet and so we're going to see this in another initiative about SLSX imports, and we can import spreadsheets of an indeterminate size and play with them. So, 1038, we'll move to personal web archive and analysis system. Project not found because my URL is missing a P. There we go. Okay. Um, have I subjected any of you to this thing called scrapbook in the past? Have you guys ever heard of scrapbook? Sid, if you were paying attention to 106, you've heard of it. Bill, if you were paying attention to 106, you've heard of it. Chain, you too, but it was pretty minimal and I just breezed by it and I said, yeah, you'll hear about this someday again. Okay, here's my scrapbook. It's a Firefox extension. I'm gonna show it in my sidebar. And um, what Scrapbook allows you to do, um, somebody give me a website that we want to go to. Um, no, Google's no fun. Let's look at the White House. Whoa, look at that. I can drag and I'm going to grab this page and I'm going to just stick it right there. And now I've archived that page. And here is my copy of that page. So it's not a link, it's a copy of that page. And it's downloaded in full hypertextual context. 
So I can navigate it. It's got everything. Um, all the images and stuff. It's actually kind of cool what it does. Um, I can't remember where I put it. It's down here. Um, here is the most recent folder I created. And these are all the files I just put on my hard drive. Every single image, every single page, all the script for that page. Okay, so scrapbook is cool. Um, what's the difference between an archive and a bookmark? Why would I want to have an archive copy rather than a bookmark? Archive copy is a saved copy that's not changeable. Bookmark will constantly be updated every time you visit it. So the, and what did you say, John? Same thing? <coughs> I'm sorry. John said something similar. I own the archive copy. It's mine. The bookmark, I go to the server and they give me what they want to give me in response to that request. The White House can't change my scrapbook version. So this is a way of creating durable personal links. And then you're saying, so where's the tiddly wiki angle to it? Um, what I've done in What I've done here is written um, these kinds of macros that let me, um, where's my White House page? Oh, here, I can get it here. Every scrapbook page has a unique timestamp to the millisecond. And here I can create a new tiddler, sorry, I can create a new tiddler with the SBK macro. I think I just have to put the timestamp in, but I'm not sure, it's been a while. That builds a link to the page. Um, looks like I did it backwards because you can never remember your code. Okay, so now I've got a link to what the White House page looked like at that time. Okay, and there's a problem in my code. Um, but if you're studying the web, if you wanted to do an analysis of what did Trump say in his White House website, you wanted to gather a bunch of pages to study them, take pictures of them, if you just wanted to describe what was going on in the web, and this is a project that you might do in any other classes, sociology, psychology, you wanted to kind of gather resources, you could do this in this approach. So that's the SBK, or scrapbook concept. Um, and we can, um, we can build on that initiative. It's a personal web archive and analysis system, um, and you get these permanent durable links to pages that you visited. As far as I know, there's no commercial product that allows you to do this. Um, and one of the interesting ideas here is that we're we're beginning to explore how to put these onto Amazon Web Services. So using TiddlyWiki as a front end to a back end of your personal archive, the question becomes, would you pay five bucks a month so that anytime you're on a web page, you can hit something on your browser and it would return to you a permanent link to that page as you saw it. So what you see is what you get in your archive and then you own it, nobody can take it away from you. Um, and the question is, would you pay for that service? And so that's actually a marketable service that we're just beginning to explore. So, okay. Questions on scrapbook, Tiddly Wiki? Photography Wiki, maybe I'll get into something that's actually of interest to you. Okay, um, 1043, um, David, we're moving on to photography. Um, like most, um, Sid, if you would see, be able to see better, you can pull that screen down so it's not so glary. Pull that one? Yeah, that string. Pull on that string and then you'll see the screen better if, you, if you're looking up there. Okay. Photography I'm really interested in um, from a Tiddly Weekly perspective, from a data perspective, and from a storytelling perspective. Okay. There's lots of archives of photographs. Um, Flickr has millions of them that are um, available for um, that are licensed for non-commercial reuse with modification. Um, 
my colleague, Catherine Stamm, I don't know if any of you know Professor Stamm, she's an anthropologist who teaches here. Uh, she's, her scholarship involves refugees in the Utica area and how they've been um, integrated and treated. And she has a collection of 20,000 photographs of refugees in Utica. Um, my 9-11 archive has some uncounted number of photographs of memorials and services around the world on 9-12, 9-13, 9-20, et cetera. Um, and so the question is, well, how could we make sense of these big um, um, archives? So I've been starting to play with that a little bit, and you can click through these examples to see. Um, there's a little bit of implementation written here. It talks about how to go to Flickr to use the API. Um, to get all the photographs from Flickr. Um, we can take a look at all the photos, and I think there's like 100 or 500 in this collection. Um, and then, Bill, this is something that you saw, and David, you saw this yesterday. This is the tagging. So you could imagine a collection. We're going to tag this. At least I don't have seasons in here. We're going to make this person happy. And um, let's um, – um, we'll just make them happy, and then you see the happy tag has shown up. Okay, so this is a way of tagging photographs, and um, in example two here, I think I've got some what I've called dynamic captioning. Um, there we go. Let's look at it. One with, there's a photograph. Um, so if you were, one of the ideas that you'd work with um, People say at the um, Mid Utica Community Center, the, uh, that's where a lot of refugees gather sort of after school, um, community members, a lot of kids. And you might say, well, get them to type something. So these are cops walking around. Um, and it sets the caption, it sets the field value of that. So we're starting to build an interactive system where non Sidliviki readers just readers, not writers, can add to our text. And so that's kind of an intriguing uh, extension um, that you could play with. Um, and then this is, oh, come on. I forgot my P again. This is a similar example of demo I did that was actually trying to get some commercial work and someday they'll come back for it. Um, but in this case, let's say that we had 500 respondents and they were telling us about how they use cleaning products of all things, okay? So um, this is some picture and now I can navigate and you're familiar with the first, previous, next, last approach to navigation. So imagine that I've got all the females. I don't know how many there are all the pictures that are taken by females and they're sorted by something like, I don't know how old they were. Okay. So there's a first picture taken by a female and there's a last one. There's this one and there's the previous one and the next one, but also for people based on their age and how frequently they clean and which sink product they use. And so now if you think about it, instead of going first, previous, next, last on one dimension, I can navigate from this picture to the first, previous, next, last on four different dimensions. Okay, so this is where you start getting into multi-dimensional tagging. So if you had a collection of photographs or objects that you wanted to have multi-dimensional navigation for, this would be the beginnings of an approach. As far as I understand, this is not something that really exists out there. This is pretty new stuff. Um, you're beginning to see places do it because we're beginning to realize we can. Um, requires, it just it requires a different approach to data. Um, what might be interesting, like, I mean, I don't, the content isn't so interesting to me ever, but I might like to put the gender tag on the top, the age on the bottom, cleaning frequency on the right, sync product on the left. So now you've got a picture with like arrows or navigational stuff surrounding it. And from this picture, you can go any different place that you want to. Begin to think about this as an app on your um, tablet. So you come up with a picture and you want to see the next one. Well, there are five next pictures. John, you look confused. You look perplexed. No, no. 
No, you get it. I'm right here. Yeah. You got it. Okay, good. So just to see if this works, like I'll go to the next picture taken by a female. Let me show you something else that I've been meaning to show you. Um, this little icon chooses a story visualization, and we're going to switch to zoom view. And I'm going to close my sidebar for this demo. So let's get to the next picture taken by a female. Let's get to the next picture taken by somebody over 70. Let's get to the next picture for the person who uses Fantastic. It's like, oh, this is a good thread. I'm going to go to the first and navigate through all of the Fantastic pictures. So this is like not your standard navigational scheme, but a multi-threaded or multi-dimensional navigational scheme. Um, this is really cool, by the way. So the photo wiki stuff is very cool. I'm, I'm excited about that. Um, so it's 1050, David. Um, I'm going to skip serial wiki and syllabus wiki because I don't think there's anything there yet, but I'll come, um, I'll talk about serial wiki really briefly and I'll add a link to it. Um, have any of you podcast fans, um, listened to the podcast called serial S E R I L. Do you ever hear of it? Okay. It's the most popular podcast in the history of the world. Um, it's a true story. Uh, it's a murder who done it. Um, Really, really briefly, a 17-year-old guy is convicted of murdering his 17-year-old girlfriend, 1999, I think. 2014, Serial, which is a spinoff of the NPR show, This American Life, produces a groundbreaking podcast that was 12 episodes of 40 minutes each in which they tell the story of this murder and cast serious doubt on the processes by which this uh, individual was convicted and raise serious doubts about his innocence or guilt. It's, it, it's super compelling audio content. Like, and it was released one episode a week and like those of us who got into it got really into it and couldn't wait for the next episode. It, if you, it's got like maybe 15 or 20 prime characters, 10 or 20, locations, 20 or so different days. And if each one of those, if you take the serial content, the 12 hours of content and chunk it out. So you've got five minutes where they're talking about what happened on this day in this place with this person. Then you could imagine a wiki that would allow you to navigate to that five minutes of audio. And then you say, okay, I want to hear the next audio, but next audio isn't what came next in the podcast. Next audio might be the next time they talked about this character or the next time they talked about this place. So what it does is it takes narrative content that was produced as audio, chunks it into smaller pieces, five minutes, four minutes, whatever, tags them. And just like in the photo wiki, we could navigate by multiple dimensions, the same with sound. So what we're doing is we're creating, we're breaking out a digital, a, a, a serial narrative and it's kind of funny because the word serial here is used in different meanings. We're breaking out a serial narrative and allowing the readers to navigate it on their own. And this is particularly useful for people who want to study and understand it because this thing gets really complicated. And then just to make serial really cool, there are these follow on podcasts, one called undisclosed and one called something else, truth and justice podcast that took the serial podcast and went way deeper sort of crowdsource the investigation and they have all this detail. So then I can take like 40 hours of audio content and intermix them. So that, that one of the suspects is named Don. He was the current, he was the murdered victim's current boyfriend. The old boyfriend was convicted. Don is the current boyfriend. It's like, maybe Don did it. Play for me all the audio that you have about Don. And so it would create on the fly for you a particular podcast about Don. So this is a way for you readers or listeners to reinterpret or re-listen to audio content or video content according to your own preferences. This is also really cool. This is not, we don't know how to do this. We're inventing this. I have one master's thesis student who completed a project starting it, but there's lots of work to be done um, involving tagging transcripts and just, you know, just going through the, and intellectually 
thinking about like, what would that interface look like? What would I have to tell my readers, my listeners to do? How, what would they need to see? So inventing a format of interactive text, in this case, it's all using audio content, but inventing the format and doing the design so that human beings could actually navigate. And then the project that you do for this class would be, well, what if I just did one episode? You don't have to do 40 hours or 50 hours of audio. Do 10 minutes of audio. And that's sufficient because we're inventing it. Um, so Serial Wiki is a way cool concept. Um, and the content is great. Oh, and just the other thing that's interesting, if we actually got enough people to work on this and to do all the 40 hours, um, Adnan, who's the guy who was convicted of the murder, 20 years later has just won a new trial. On the basis of serials and the follow-ons, he's actually gonna have a new trial, although the state is currently appealing it, so maybe it won't happen. When this new trial happens, which it will, there will be large-scale media and public focus on that case. And if we're ready to go with a highly annotated wiki that pulls apart the case based on the auto content, we'd get lots of hits and we'd be famous. And it would be cool because people would actually understand it. So that's a really cool project. I, I need people to work on that. Um, uh, 1055, David. Um, syllabus wiki, there's nothing there again, but it's the concept of using Tidly Wiki to create a course syllabus. Those of you who are particularly interested in education, you know, you think about the way that my syllabi look. Um, You've got your assignments, your readings, the weeks, the, 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 all the different pieces of it. And there's a, I've got a whole series of templates that will help you write this. Um, and so in particular, the IDT students who teach, especially if you teach college courses, you write so by all the time. This is a technique of weakifying your syllabus. And um, what it does is it allows you, and again, the, the undergrad students are probably uh, not interested in this potentially, but it allows you to build an assessment um, which is a really important thing for us these days. Um, and so it's just kind of, it, it puts another um, level of sophistication into your, um, into your syllabus. You could continue to use Word, but you might be able to advance your stuff here. Um, so that's the syllabus wiki. Um, that was only a minute. 1056, David, we're into this notion of tag grid. And um, some of you are going to say, hey, we could have used this for exercise three. And you're absolutely right. Okay. Um, David, did you enter and sign in? You're back now? I don't think I left. Okay, good. Um, um, I've got 1055 to 1056 was about the uh, syllabus. Okay, so if you're looking at this X-tab testing, it looks like um, I've written a macro that flips around the rows and columns of two tabs. So you can throw them into a table and you've got the, here you've got the colors across the top and the manufacturers down the side and then you can click on this and it will take you to that car. You can tell I got bored, I didn't even make pictures of it. Um, or you can go back to the macro and flip it around. Uh, and now we've got the cards across the top, colors on the, on the x-axis, cards on the y-axis. So um, this is a way of representing a bunch of objects. Um, and so the idea would be, well, how does this macro work? Um, let's look at the x-tab macro, um, which is probably in here somewhere, x-tab macro. Um, and I don't even know if it's particularly complicated. I don't remember it. It's a little complicated, but it's mostly using HTML table formats. And the idea is this stuff looks kind of nasty, but it's really not. Once you start reading, it's just language. It's just words. And you can, you'll see where the tag is and you can substitute your tag. Um, so this would be the X tabs tag grid. It's a way of displaying in the interaction of one tag, of two tags with each other. Um, and I think there's a three-way version going in here, um, or even more, you know, four-way tables, they get a little complicated. So that's X-Tab, Tag Grid, and X-Tab Macros. Um, 1059, we're moving really quickly. Um, those who are into 
bibliographic work. Wow, I did a really bad job last night. Any of you ever build a bibliography? Probably. Um, this is a complicated system for those, particularly for scholars, faculty, graduate students, maybe undergraduate students who really who sort of want to get a, a handle on some bibliographic techniques. So I'm using this thing out there called BibTech and this other features called JabRef and all sorts of stuff. Um, we now have a bunch of references entered in. This is what a reference looks like. Um, this happens automatically. If you go to um, Google Scholar, and I'll type in JabRef. So I'm running it. Um, let's find if there's anybody who's written about TiddlyWiki, how I've been here before. Um, and I th think I can import this. You get that kind of a reference, Google Scholar or other citation engines produce it for you. And then there's a sequence of events in which you bring them in and then you can use it to generate a reference list. So that's a way of generating a reference, a bibliography. Um, and what's cool about bibliographies is they're so system driven. There's rules and there's formats, and then you figure out a way as a project of how do I, how do I get TiddlyWiki to generate a bibliography um, as a system? Um, I don't know if have any of you used any bibliographic systems, ever had to Zotero, EasyBib, yeah. So this was HardBib. Uh, it's not easier than EasyBib, guaranteed. Um, I mean that the. the we're not looking for less complex solutions. Over time, we might, but right now we're trying to get into the nitty gritty of like, well, how does EasyBib work? Most of you approach things like EasyBib as users. Now we're approaching them as a designer. So it's gonna be a little more complicated. Okay, 1101, David, we'll move on to wiki slides. Um, all of my links are just busticated. Cool. Um, so you've seen TiddlyWiki work so far as what I think of as text format, sort of Tiddler by Tiddler. Um, it also functions as a slide presenter. Um, so I can go next, next. My term paper is hypertext links, full screen video clips, animated fonts, and awesome 3D special effects. Now I need a topic. We don't need topics so much in this class. We need hypertext links, full screen video clips, animated fonts, and awesome 3D special effects okay, for the designing part. Um, and so this is, you know, talks a little bit about it, and I talk about how I built this. Um, and um, where's my next link? And then you return to the wiki. Um, why would you want to do this? Who would want to do this? Who ever has to give slide presentations? I do. Who else? When? When are you going to give slide presentations? Assuming you're not going to be college professors. I don't see any of you having the talent or intelligence to be a college professor. I'm kidding. <laughs> give slide presentations? Yeah. To your colleagues or your clients, yeah. if you're pitching, sure, definitely slide. So why would you want this? Why would you want slides on top of a wiki as opposed to just give them the slides? Because slides uh, usually display minimal information. If you wanted to explore an idea, you could navigate to another tip. During your presentation? Yeah. Or? Your clients could do it on their own after your presentation. So you know how like you talk about in some of your classes, oh, you got to have to have a takeaway, something to leave behind. So here you've got your slides. You say, yeah, here's your HTML file. And if you want to click on like 
you know, if you want to see what these things mean, you just go there. So you can have all the background embedded, like your whole proposal, which is text, right? Have any of you done the um, practicum class? You're doing practicum now? No, you're doing portfolio now. Yeah. Okay. Because practicum is a fall class. That was, uh, that was with Gretchen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So you had to do, you had to like, create a project that you're going to pitch to someone, right? So you could do your slides, and then if you wanted to give them the full proposal, the 50-page, whatever, I mean, I'm not sure you had to do that, but like if you're going to give them the whole the budget and all that stuff, you incorporate that all into the wiki, and you put the slides on top of it, they only have a single file to deal with, and you've got control of it. So this intermixed slides is um, cool. They're really cool, actually. It's like, wow. And you can't do that in Word and PowerPoint. It's like there's PowerPoint and there's Word. And what TiddlyWiki does with these Intermax slides is brings them together. So as a designer, you have to say, well, how's that gonna work? Like what would I have to do for my clients? Like they need to have this button at the end that says um, return to the wiki. And it needs to be kind of not between the red and the blue because I've screwed it up. I haven't done enough with it. Anyway, that's cool. The, by the way, this uses a thing called themes, and that's a part of TiddlyWiki we haven't touched yet. And in order to get it to work in slides, you just switch the theme to punk or to punch. And if to turn the slides off, you switch back to vanilla theme, or you switch it to snow white theme. I don't know the difference between snow white and vanilla. And you can make your own themes, which is also cool. Okay. 11.06, Mr. Beck. And then I'm going to end with this XLS imports thing. Okay. Um, you guys are spreadsheetable. I mean, you've done spreadsheets. Do you use spreadsheets? No, you're not spreadsheet fans. Sid, you're not a spreadsheet fan. You're not into spreadsheets too much, right? Um, spreadsheets are life. If you don't know spreadsheets, then you're not alive. All right, that's an exaggeration. Um, the basic concept of a spreadsheet is it displays data in rows and columns, okay? Where the rows are your case in general. It, does, it can be elsewhere, but let's just assume that we're gonna stick with this notion. The rows are your cases, and the columns are the characteristics or attributes of that case. So what in your life, oh, well, forget about your life. Um, so I might build a spreadsheet of students in my classes. Each one of you would be a row. And then the first column would be, did, did, did he show up on the first day? The second column would be, what was her score on the first exam? And the third column would be, what's her final grade? So you've got that picture in your mind of a spreadsheet. Um, how many rows can you have in a spreadsheet? How many cases could you describe? Many. Many. In thousands tens of thousands, not millions, okay? And TiddlyWiki, I don't think it's really robust enough. It, it really begins to drag currently when you get much over 2,000, 3,000 cases. Um, so what I did for this demo is I went off and found a spreadsheet, and you could do the same thing. You go find a spreadsheet out there in the world, and there's just Millions of them because people are sharing their spreadsheets around. So this is a spreadsheet of world cities, latitude, longitude, database resources. If I um, open the spreadsheet in Excel, if I open the spreadsheet in Excel, oh, it's coming. I think it's coming. There it is. Um, I see that I have a list, got the names of the fields across the top. So the first column is the city name. The second is the city name in ASCII. Third looks like it's the latitude. The fourth is the longitude, then the population, then the country. And then I don't know what ISO 2 and ISO 3 is. Oh, that's the name of the country in two or three letter, you know, standard things. And then the province that the city's in. Um, there are 7,323 cities listed here. This is kind of intriguing and interesting, but ultimately not navigable by human beings. So what I do 
and this is what you could do as a project as well, um, is use this XLS imports tool. And this gets, this is a little slow right now because there's 7,000 records in it. And so this is what I mean by it slows down. Um, and so I write, I don't have to write this, I use the tool, um, which talks about like, and allows you to understand the data in a different way. Um, and then I can navigate to um, cities and um, tell stories about the cities. So here it's a simple story, like what's its name, what's its province, what country is it in, and, and how many people live there. Um, I can go to Brazil and tell a story about a country, like what cities does Brazil have? Um, and so, you know, that's, this isn't quite that interesting yet, but you can begin to see where you could build these interfaces and you can find spreadsheets for anything or you can build your own spreadsheet. So, um, Bill, if you're into games and you wanted to track a game and find all the characters or all the locations or all the, whatever it is that you want, if you can represent it in a spreadsheet, we can import it and treat and create different objects from the characters, the locations, the, their emotions, whatever it is that you want, we can create objects with it using this tool and you don't have to do it by yourself. It's like when you built eight objects by hand, no big deal. 27, you guys started to roll your eyes. 7,000, you're not doing it, right? I mean, even 27 is pretty much beyond what you want to do by hand. So you have to use tools to do it. Um, you can go to Wikipedia and get lists of things like this and figure out how to save any list in Wikipedia as a spreadsheet, and then you can make a navigable wiki out of that list. So absolutely anything. Um, and that's another kind of project that you could work on. Um, so I'm gonna stop there.